The material in this video was originally prepared for and presented at a meeting of the Extramural Research and Training Centers funded by the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health on July 26th through the 28th of 2022. The theme of this meeting was preparing for the future of worker safety, health, and well-being through innovations in training, research, and practice. This meeting brought together occupational safety and health research, academic, and practitioner communities to consider the most pressing issues and explore opportunities for collaboration to help prepare for the impact of the future of work on occupational safety and health for the nation. We hope you enjoy the following presentations. Thank you so much for joining this session today on innovations in occupational safety and health training. NIOSH has a long history of conducting innovative research to find effective ways to reduce workplace injuries and illnesses through training across many industries and worker populations. NIOSH also supports academic degree programs and research training opportunities in areas including industrial hygiene, occupational health nursing and medicine, and occupational safety. Today, we have the pleasure of hearing from two speakers who bring with them unique and expert views on innovations in OSH training. <clears throat> Excuse me, from a frontline worker perspective to a classroom based education and research center or ERC perspective. Before I introduce our speakers, a few housekeeping items. Each speaker will have 20 minutes to present, and there'll be 20 minutes for Q&A at the end of the session, as uh, Jessica mentioned. But please feel free to use the chat liberally to pose questions and comments, and I'll be monitoring the conversation there. At the conclusion of the session, participants will be automatically pulled back into the main meeting room. And after the session, there will be a 30-minute break. Because we have an ambitious agenda today, I will briefly introduce our two speakers, and I would refer you to the center's meeting website where you can access the full speaker bios. So to begin, Dr. Patrick O'Shaughnessy is a professor in the Department of Occupational and Environmental Health at the University of Iowa. He is the director of the NIOSH-funded ERC, the Heartland Center for Occupational Safety and Health. Welcome, Dr. O'Shaughnessy. And Dr. Sue Ann Sarpy is principal and founder of Sarpy and Associates and serves as the behavioral economics advisor of the Research to Practice Initiative for CPWR, the Center for Construction, Research and Training. Welcome Dr. Sarpy and please get us started. Okay. Good morning. Rebecca, like you, I can't see whether or not you can see me. I've got the video on, but regardless, I'll go ahead and get started. We can see you. Okay, for some reason it doesn't come up on my screen, but that's the wonders of Zoom. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit this morning and I'm, I've am i got an ambitious slide set, so I'm, I might be going through this rather quickly, but I'm happy at the during the discussion section to answer any questions you have. What I'd like to do is talk a little bit about a study that I conducted um, during the COVID pandemic. It's a follow-up study to uh, previous research with the uh, CPWR. Um, when early on in the pandemic, um, they were starting to translate their courses that were traditionally conducted in face-to-face -face format, but because of COVID and the need for COVID training, they rapidly, like all the other organizations, started translating these uh, health and safety courses and these trainings into the distance format. So very early on, we did a, a, a quick rapid study where we looked at the effectiveness of these short duration, they were one hour, six hour courses focused on COVID and looked at the effectiveness of distance versus uh, face to face. And what we found in the, in the initial studies was they use a highly interactive synchronous distance learning technique in their health and safety training. And we found that they were in fact, for these short courses, quite effective. They did see some, um, some mediation with uh, trainees competence. And we'll talk a little bit about that in the subsequent studies. But I created resources for them because early on there weren't a lot of resources for the translation to these distance courses. And that can be found, the full report and the additional resources that we conducted for the COVID training. But what they came back to me and said was, you know, we, we really want to start, as the pandemic raged on, we want to look at converting some of our trainings of longer duration and looking at them, not just the CPWR um, training 
providers, but also their NAB2 affiliates, and that stands for those of you who don't know, the North America Building Trades Unions affiliate. And they wanted to look at, we looked at self-report measures in the initial rapid study, and they said, you know, can we start looking at longer term impact? Can we look at more objective measures? And so what that's really what this study is all about. We selected two OSHA courses, the 510 and 500. They were provided face-to-face pre-pandemic and modified to distance during the pandemic. And it was delivered by 13 um, of the uh, CPWR and NAB2 affiliate providers. And the dates ranged from November 2018 pre-pandemic to about a year ago, um, June 2021 during the pandemic. And what I here's just the, the course um, objectives. And what I just want to point out is the contact hours are essentially 26, but they run a little more than 26 for both courses. And the difference between the two is the 500 course actually has a, a student demonstration in it. So it gave us a, a way to measure when they're actually demonstrating, can they do this effectively in the coursework online? So initially what we did was use these, and I'm gonna take you sequentially through this. This is immediate learning. Um, CPWR and its affiliates use a um, uh, evaluation immediately following training that looks at effectiveness learning. And then they also have a standardized test. That's their objective measure of learning. And I just wanted to also point out, this slide just shows you how many were in the face-to-face -face versus distance for the two courses that we were able to, to generate a fairly substantial sample size, which it was at the point when we collected this data um, kind of unique because most of the studies we were seeing had very small sample size. So we felt that the findings were fairly robust. And what we, what we found was similar to the shorter courses, the ratings of effectiveness for these highly synchronous um, highly interactive courses, even of longer duration, we were seeing um, quite um, high ratings with respect to the distance learning. But what you will note is, and just to let you orient to these slides, I did the face-to-face -face in gold because it's sort of their gold standard. It's what they're traditionally used to. The green is the distance learning. And what you'll see is there were some significant differences, um, particularly with instructional effectiveness that lean toward face-to-face, -face, that they still rated the face-to-face -face more effective than the distance learning, although the distance learning, as you can see on a scale, from one least affected to five highly effective scored quite well. What we did also do was we looked at the objective measures of immediate learning. And the red line here is the passing score for the courses. And what you'll see is while the distance courses they did quite well, it wasn't any one course sort of crashed and burned, they were passing, but the incremental gains in learning were higher for the face-to-face. -face. And if you'll note in the OSHA 500 with that, that hands-on component, that was a large effect size between the face-to-face -face and the distance. So what we did at that point was sort of take a deeper dive. We saw both demonstrated high ratings of effectiveness and learning gains, but we saw a slight edge to the face-to-face -face, and we wanted to gain a greater understanding of why are we getting those differences for the distance learning? And so I had sessions, we did semi-structured interviews with those uh, 10 of the 13 NAP2 affiliates. And I sat down with them and went through how were they designing these courses? We knew they were using that same peer training model, which is they use the seasoned instructors, a lot of discussion, a lot of interaction. And what we found was there were many, many similarities in the way they were designing and delivering the training. They have multiple instructors. As I said, they were seasoned instructors. They had more than one so that there was one instructor that could handle the technical difficulties that, that would oftentimes did actually occur during the trade excuse me, the training. They had orientation sessions prior to training where they, not just for the students, but also for the instructors so that they got the skill level up to a certain point because they were using Zoom. It was synchronous, it was highly interactive. So they were engaging in breakout rooms, small group, large group discussions, and they were all doing this across the board. They also used a standardized testing mechanism that kept the camera on while they took the test. So all those were similar. Where we saw the differences occurring was the scheduling of training. And there was essentially four variables that we found. They either gave them lunch or they didn't. The length of the training before they gave them breaks in the session, the lengths of the breaks they provided, and whether or not the training was given on consecutive versus um, a, over a weekend break. 
And so what you'll see on this slide is they kind of fell into four different um, groups from you know, the, the shorter training sessions to the longer training sessions. But what I highlighted, because this is where we found the significant differences, where there were two um, fundamental differences in thought when they were scheduling. And one was, we wanna keep this engaging. This is in front of a computer. It's hard for people to sit in front of a computer. And if you know, if you've taken um, workshops that, that run over a subsequent number of days, it gets harder and harder each day to stay engaged. And this is important for them. So there was one philosophy of let's make the training session shorter, hour to hour and a half. Let's give them lots of breaks, 10 to 15 minutes every hour, hour and a half distributed throughout the day. And they had consecutive days. Then there were people that sort of fell, uh, providers that fell in the middle that had the longer training sessions with breaks that included lunch. And they either started with a shorter break or started with a longer break. And then the other end of the continuum was the weekend break. These were the longest training sessions, two to two and a half hours, one long break, 45 minutes, it included lunch. It was spread out over several days and it ran over a weekend. So it wasn't, it was consecutive days, then a weekend break and then consecutive days to uh, finish. And what we found was, um, and the pattern was similar for both courses, is the shortest training, that short burst of training with break, with no real lunch break, tended to have the least amount of, of um, demonstration of learning on the standardized testing. Those longest training sessions with the longest breaks that included lunch, that had a duration with a weekend break that weren't consecutive day after day, tended to fare better in both sessions. So this gave us an idea. This was something that was very interesting for the training centers. They really did want to have a better understanding as they engage in these longer courses. Did scheduling have an effect? And yes, in fact, we found that um, for these, but for both courses. I'm sorry, I'm trying to get this to. The other thing we, we took a look at was impact of training. And for those of you um, who study training and, and worker populations, um, this is a, a commonly used um, training schema where what we just talked about were the boxes of the green with the training design and the training characteristics and, and that immediate learning, that immediate right after you take the course, did you do well on the test? But what most training centers are, are keenly interested in is where the rubber meets the road. Do they de then retain the training uh, uh, three to six months out and do they use it on the job so that you see greater health and safety at the work sites? And so that's what the second part of our study really looked at. I designed a distance learning evaluation to look at these um, courses um, three to six months after training, look at the, how they rated effectiveness, and these were self-reports, how they reported their knowledge retention and their performance on the job. One of the first things I'm always asked was, you know, did, because there were all these different um, NAP2 affiliates, did the trades represented interact with or moderate their effectiveness ratings and their performance? And we did not find any differences. So across the trades, these are the results that we found. Just as with our shorter courses, one of the things they were very interested in was technological competence. And when we looked at technological competence, some initially people kind of thought, well, younger workers will be more competent in technology and older workers will be less competent in technology. And what we came to found, find was that wasn't necessarily the case. So we started simply asking them two components. How comfortable are you with using the technology and how skilled are you using the technology? What we find is comfort is actually more important with these worker trainings. And this, one of the questions that I've been asked over and over again is, did you measure how much comfort has changed the technology? When, the, when, when COVID first started, most of us didn't even know what Zoom was. Now, if you're like me, you use it basically every day. And what we did was we asked them, how much has your comfort with the technology changed? And what you'll see on the slide is as of about a year ago, most of them reported they had improved or greatly improved over 50%, just as we expected. People are becoming more comfortable with the technology. But to that end, where did they land? Okay, they're more comfortable with it, but how, how much does that translate? And what we find is in terms of their landing point, and this was a year ago, about a half said they were very comfortable, uh, about a third said they were comfortable, 
but we still had uh, these meaningful percentage of somewhat comfortable or less. And we wanted to see, was that in fact impacting those transfer outcomes when they were the, in the sense of were they retaining the information and were they using it on the job? So three to six months later, how were their self, what did they self-report? And just to let you orient to this slide, and I know I'm going through this rather quickly, um, these are measures three to six months out. The green is those that were very comfortable, the yellow comfortable, and the red is neutral to somewhat comfortable. And what you'll see is very strikingly that trainees technological comfort does impact the training outcomes. And what you'll see is even being somewhat or sort of neutral on that scale, you're seeing significantly less um, in their self-reported outcomes of those uh, three to six months out when they're transferring on the job. And this is very important in terms of our thinking of making sure as we use this distance learning technology, particularly for these longer courses, that there was a certain level of comfort from the folks taking the training to ensure those that training transfer that we're also interested in. I will tell you, we also looked at skill and technology and the skill and technology did have some impact, but nothing like the comfort technology. So I don't, I don't wanna underplay the fact that skill did increase and it did impact a few of the ratings, but comfort was the one that really, that, that we keyed in on and was most important. The other question that we tried to answer within this study was continued use of distance learning moving forward. When we did our initial um, very early on in the pandemic, when they were giving the COVID courses, the thinking was we do face to face, we do it well, and we're going to go back to face to face as soon as possible. As we've moved forward the pandemic and we've used this distance learning more often, all of us, and as the training centers have used it more often, there's some interest in, hey, we might want to integrate this in and make it part of our face to face trainings. How do, how do, can you measure and see how are we doing? So one of the things that I used, and those of you that are familiar with the business world will be familiar with this concept of self-promoter score, excuse me, not promoter score. And what you literally do, it's a score that just looks at, you ask them, how likely are you to recommend these courses delivered via distance learning on a scale from zero to 10? This has been used a lot during the pandemic. When you change a product or service, this gives you customer experience and it's indicative of whether or not um, the custom, customer is satisfied with whatever your change in product or service is. And it looks at customer experience and the way they it's um, derived is they rate it on a scale from zero to 10. The promoters are those that are very positive about the training. They give it scores of nine or 10. Passes are sort of in the middle. They can they ride the fence at seven or eight. The detractors are the folks that probably will not want to use it again. They give it to zero to six. And the way you get the net promoter score is you take the percentage of promoters and subtract out the percentage of detractors. Very, very uh, straightforward. So it can range from negative 100 if no one likes the training to positive 100 if 100% 100 of the people give it a, a 10. And what you do is you look at it on the continuum, it, it, you know, this shows you needs improvement, good, great, excellence. You're, you're really trying to achieve that score of 71 to 100, where the most folks are saying, giving you the ratings of nine or 10. And what we found when we asked the trainees, um, and I, the reason I did the schema is it's hard to think, what does a 33 mean? What does that look like? What does a 36 mean? Well, it means they're doing quite well. And I would argue right out of the chute, these are very high scores. We're trying to achieve between 71 to 100 in terms of net promoters when you're changing a product or service. But right out of the chute, this, you'll see that they said they were very likely to recommend this to others. But because of the importance of the um, trainers in this process, the training centers also wanted to take a look and see what their feedback was. And what you'll see is when you get a negative net promoter score, that's, this is what it looks like, is that many more of them were less interested in providing um, the distance learning, the 510s and 500s distance learning, than they were um, positive to very likely to want to recommend that again. And that score is just a score. And you know, if it's a negative score, you've got some work to do. So what you need to do is gather that qualitative information. And that's what's on this slide is we got feedback from them on why this is the trainer's perspective. And what you'll see the lower scores, they listed more weaknesses, but essentially while they acknowledge that what's in yellow is the difference that we found between early on in the pandemic with the COVID trainings and these longer trainings, while they're now seeing the, they're acknowledging the convenience, the efficiency, the safety that it provides, 
in giving the distance learning, particularly during a pandemic. What they don't like is the limited student support, the engagement. And we just heard about the importance of this in our previous session is the social interaction is much more hard to emulate online. And it's something that the um, trainees say, and in particular, the trainers say, and it's something that I would argue in the future, we need to really give this some thought as we move forward with this distance learning. Yes, we see that, you know, we got very positive um, results with respect to effectiveness and impact, but we really need to think about looking at it from an outcome perspective of social interaction, social support in these virtual environments and bolstering that, expanding our view of the trainee. We know that the trainee characteristics of, of comfort and the training characteristics of schedule importance are important, but we can also expand that. And as we move forward, integrating what we find the best of with the face-to-face, -face, with the best of in these distance and uh, learning experiences and these hybrid formats and the use of net promoter scores, because those give us a good sort of uh, gauge of how we're doing and allow us to track that as we expand into different courses. And in fact, that's what we will be doing. The next um, uh, iteration of this will be with the longer courses with the Haswhopper 40-hour uh, course, which is over five days. Just in terms of acknowledgement, I wanted to acknowledge my colleagues um, at the University of Wisconsin-Stout and also at CPWR. I could not possibly have done this research without CPWR and the NAP2 affiliates and their participation um, in encouraging um, the response rate for my survey as well as with the um, structure, semi-structured interview and also support from NIEHS. And I went through that rather quickly and I'm happy to take questions um, and in the question um, and answer portion of this. Thank you, Dr. Sarfi. That was a really exciting and interesting presentation. I certainly have a lot of questions for you. We've been uh, using the OSHA in a, a 10 hour course in one of our trainings. So I'd love to ask you some questions either after the second presentation or offline. Um, so in the interest of time, why don't we go ahead and hand it over to Dr. O'Shaughnessy. Are you there? I'm here. So hello, everyone uh, from the heartland of America. Who would have known that the largest uh, bicycle ride in the country is going on right now across Iowa? It's called Rag Bri. Uh, 10 to 12,000 people all uh, out there sweating away in the, in the sun, but we're having beautiful uh, weather this week. So I thought I'd just put a plug in for them. <laughs> Uh, so I've been asked to talk about innovative training methods. Um, I'm honored to have been asked. Uh, thank you, uh, Elizabeth and Sarah, because I'm sure any ERC director uh, would be glad to um, have this role right now and, and uh, showcase the types of training that, that they do in their particular uh, centers. Uh, but so I'll do as much justice as I can amongst the, uh, the folks that we have here. Uh, when I was asked to do this, I, I immediately sent out an email for help from my various uh, professors here in the in this uh, Heartland Center, uh, who were glad to provide a, a variety of different uh, tips and techniques uh, that I'll share with you today. And so, of that collection, um, uh, Diane Roman, who heads up our um, program in agricultural safety and health um, up until this summer. Uh, I was going to talk a little bit about hazard mapping. I'm going to ask her to, to jump in here as well as some OSHA training that she asked her students to do. Uh, Tom Peters is our industrial hygiene director. Uh, he uses a flipped classroom design. I'm going to talk a little bit about some statistical techniques that have been kind of a, a problem for us, to be honest, and some solutions for that. Uh, our Occupational Safety and Health Director, Nir Karen, uh, does some virtual reality. And I'll, I'll discuss uh, Renee Anthony, uh, has her students do some public service announcements, and we're going to talk a little bit about health equity and some professional development uh, type topics. So, so with that, um, I know Diane is, is out there, um, and she does this much more so than I, so I'm going to ask her to jump in and uh, give a description of the hazard mapping process she does. Thanks. Thanks, Patrick. So um, in addition to being part of our Heartland DRC at the University of Iowa, I also direct our Healthier Workforce Center of the Midwest, a total worker health um, center. And one of the activities that we have integrated into various outreach activities is hazard mapping. And I think some people may know this, other people may not be familiar with it. 
But we wanted to find a way to come up with an interactive activity, which not only talks about recognizing traditional hazards in the workplace, but also thinks about some of those new hazards that are covered more under the total worker health um, program. So it's a pretty simple activity. Um, we have a big piece of paper and some markers. Um, just to note, don't use permanent markers because they'll bleed through the paper. Um, and we break, break people up into small groups and ask them to draw their workplace or a workplace. Um, most people have worked and they are able to come up with something, even if they've never worked there. So you, you pretty much lay out the workplace, you add in different components of it. You can see this is a grocery store. So we have checkout, we have the deli counter, we have the frozen food and we have a pharmacy. And then the second part of this is really just to, as a group, identify what hazards you see in the workplace. And you can circle those on the map or you can use a different color and write them in there. Um, and so if we think about it, a lot of times we start with those traditional hazards. So maybe it's heavy lifting, maybe it's uh, working in a cold area, maybe it's the um, slicing machine in the deli. But we also ask them to think beyond that and think about things like job design. You know, are there hours long? Are there um, not enough workers? So they're being asked to stay over their shift. Are there unrealistic deadlines, you know, trying to get all of the aisles stocked during the night when you don't have enough workers? Turnover. We look at organizational practices, um, you know, inflexible rules, poor supervision, um, job insecurity, and also interpersonal relationships. Uh, supervisors who maybe have not had training in how to supervise or aren't good communicators bullying and harassment in the workplace. So those get added to the map and they um, start the conversation about how, um, you know, how these interact with some of those more traditional hazards. And I think one of the reasons why it works is that it's a participatory approach. It's people working together. So we actually have created a short video that shows how this can work. And we have a toolbox talks, and those are some of the resources if you're interested in trying this. Every time I use this, it works. I've used it with University of Iowa students, um, and I've also worked with other ERCs, the Minnesota ERC. Um, and I will say it works both in person and online. You just have use the breakout rooms. So Patrick, if you want to go ahead, I'll just mention briefly. Um, and so I direct the um, up until a couple of weeks ago, the Agricultural Safety and Health Program. And um, one of the things I wanted to do was to make sure our students had a good grounding in safety. So we have not only students in public health, but we also have pharmacy and uh, medical students taking our class. And they don't often walk in with a um, background in safety. So there's an OSHA 10 hour training that's online thinking about our previous presentation there, um, that they are required to take. And then what's really nice, and they're, they always like this, is they get an OSHA 10 card at the end of it. Um, so just ways that we have worked to integrate these different things into our, our classrooms. Thank you. And thank you, Diane, really appreciate it. Um, so to move along, uh, another concept here, and I'm sure you're all familiar with the, the modality of a flipped classroom. Uh, we use them somewhat sparingly, I should say. Um, it's, the idea, of course, is that you have a student prepare themselves before entering the classroom, uh, typically by, say, reading some uh, textbook material or, or uh, getting themselves prepared for a laboratory exercise, that sort of thing. But of course, in this, this era of uh, videography, there's opportunities as well to have a student uh, teach themselves, in a sense, uh, what they need to know in this case for a lab. And that's uh, what Dr. Peters does in his uh, aerosols course. So he has them uh, watch a YouTube lecture, perform some homework on, on a particular topic area. You can see here, there's a lot of math associated with uh, gravity settling of particles in the air, uh, what's going on there. And so there's, there's a lot that needs to be discussed up front that a student really needs to grasp um, both in terms of lecture material, he gives them in, up front as well as kind of reinforcement in these videos uh, prior to the lab exercise so that by the time they walk into, into the, the room associated with the lab, they, they really have a really good grasp of, of what it is that they're trying to do and, and the fundamental knowledge areas behind it. So that is a, a suggestion uh, to try to uh, 
a break up again, the kind of the, the classic lecture based um, uh, process in a didactic uh, classroom scenario for a variety of different methods. This, ha just, this just happens to be a, for a lab based uh, segment of, of a particular course. Um, and I, I started off by saying sparingly because uh, at least it's my impression that if I guess if I were a student, I wouldn't want to take a course that was entirely flipped, although um, some people have done that effectively. So now it's a, it's a matter of, oh, that's nice. I mean, where did this YouTube lecture come from? Uh, so uh, Tom had to create that himself up front. And so there's some upfront work. Uh, many of us have pre-recorded lectures now from the COVID era, right, that we can uh, pull back up if we'd like to as, as one easy way to get at some of this lecture material uh, via videos. Um, another option, I uh, just want to give a shout out to some, some work that's been going on at the University of Minnesota and their ERC. Um, uh, Pete Rayner up there. I say up there because they, <laughs> they are just north of us, um, as well as uh, Tom here at Iowa and some folks at the Dakota County Technical College put together a large series of occupational safety and health videos that uh, goes by the acronym of METFAST, the Midwest Emerging Technologies Public Health and Safety Training Program. So just Google METFAST, uh, those words, and this will pop up and you'll see Pete uh, giving some instructions along with uh, a fairly large listing of various videos on occupational safety and health themes. Uh, the ones I list here are the ones I, I picked out that seem to be most um, uh, general, say, that, that could be used by anyone. The others that are given in METFAST are, are more uh, industrial hygiene based and so not, not quite as, as, as general to everyone. You can see here there's a video on occupational hygiene principles, risk assessment principles, uh, and then down at the bottom, personal sampling, uh, interactive activity that they have. They're really well done videos with some graphics and even some animation associated with them. And then a, another shout out um, is to uh, Susan Arnold, who is now the PI of the next level of MetFast that's being called Interact. Um, I'm involved with this as well as, as, as is uh, Rachel Jones, uh, now at UCLA. Congratulations, Rachel. Um, and uh, this will emphasize some uh, modern types of advanced manufacturing techniques in many of the videos, but it will also contain uh, videos on, on more uh, general types of, of topic areas. So I want you to be aware of this and, and feel free to, to utilize them. That's what they're there for. So, um, Speaking of videos again, <laughs> moving along to this concept of statistical techniques, and this, this takes just a little bit of background uh, to go along with this, this idea here. And I don't know if for the rest of you, you being ERCs primarily or anyone in academia that's trying to um, properly train MS and PhD students, but particularly MS, and the MS students we have in industrial hygiene, ergonomics, agricultural safety and health, have a two year window to get through their degree, typically, and within that they have the opportunity for one course in statistics, they don't, they don't have the room in their curriculum for two courses. So the option typically has been take the introductory course in biostatistics that most uh, colleges of public health obviously have, uh, we found that to be deficient in training our students to utilize the, the lab-based or field-based um, data that they derive as part of their thesis, which often required analyses that go beyond what the introductory course, which is often pretty much typically generated and geared towards the MPH student, uh, not the MS. And so, uh, for example, our biostatistics course, and again, not to disparage them, they do a wonderful job at what they do, uh, but it pretty much ends at the t-test and they do not get into a linear regression, certainly not multivariable regression. Uh, they don't talk about ANOVA analysis, but these are things that often pop up as, as a necessary type of statistical analysis by a student doing some research in the lab. So uh, to answer that problem here, 
uh, just happened that I had taken many statistics courses as part of my PhD work. I raised my hand and said, well, uh, I can develop such a course. And I have been teaching such a course for the past 12 years that, that moves through and beyond t-test into these other types of statistical analysis techniques. Now, what I give up is a lot of biostatistics. I don't even talk about an odds ratio because our students don't do thesis research that typically deals with an odds ratio, for example. So I know it's kind of a anathema to a college of public health uh, training, but uh, the, the course I taught was was with this type of, of junior scientist in mind. Uh, so you can see here, and so now um, that course has been terminated here uh, for various reasons. One of which is a a bandwidth issue in our department, uh, whereby we just can't offer the service, so to speak, to the college of another statistics course when there's courses within our realm that need to be taught. So. Uh, so to move this conversation forward, what will happen, and I'm just putting this out to you as well, and feel free to engage with me after this, that I will now be developing a series of videos, much like the MetFast kind of concept on these statistical techniques. And the idea that we're going to pilot this fall with our industrial hygiene students is they will take a lab, for example, that will involve uh, two airflow measurement uh, devices and a comparison between them. Well, that's a t-test that needs to be done. So they're gonna be asked to watch a video on, on the development of a t-test and how you do it in Excel. Uh, I'll restrict it to that. Uh, and then there'll be another one later on in their controls course on ductwork velocities and they'll have to do an ANOVA. So they'll be, so we'll integrate the statistical analyses this, that way uh, and, and we, we hope that also will make it more relevant to the student. So they'll be taking the Biostat 1 course uh, right up front, their fall of their first semester they get here, and then we'll be feeding them, so to speak, these additional uh, analysis methods as, as time goes on. And I'd be curious to hear in the Q&A of, of this, this issue, and maybe, I don't know if it's unique to us, I'd, I'd be surprised if it is, and how it's overcome in your, in your particular colleges. So that's um, that's a to be to be done uh, concept. Now I'd like to jump into virtual reality, <laughs> literally. Um, so this, as you all know, the, the concept behind it: you wear the goggles and you 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 walk into this virtual reality world. Um, the idea is to uh, you know utilize this as an interactive and constructive engagement. In this case, to enhance risk assessment skills or to allow a student to think through um, these mental models of complex topics. Now, this is all associated with our occupational safety program uh, at Iowa State University, uh, directed by Dr. Nir Kieran, who is uh, one of the leaders in the use of virtual reality for safety related issues. And unfortunately, I can't show videos, but I can just give you a few, a, a concept of it here. Um, so, for example, uh, doing a risk analysis and management uh, assessment by the student, the idea is that they are tasked to um, design an industrial system and then develop a conceptual approach to their system design. So that these, most of these students are engineers, along with taking the safety, um, because it's out of an engineering school. So that, that's kind of an engineering part of it. But then they're supposed to do the preliminary hazard analysis. This is all in this virtual world. It's pretty amazing. And then design the system with an immersive uh, virtual reality application. And then, then they can go, kind of go back at it and, and, and conduct a complete risk assessment and then write up a report. So as part of this, they have to create this, this um, design of, of some sort of system that then needs to be uh, analyzed. So when they put on the goggles and they hold these controller things in each hand, uh, they are faced with this problem statement in this virtual world that tells them what they need to be building and what they need to do. And these uh, controllers have little GPS kind of motion detectors in them. So when they are moved, they are, they are moved within the virtual world as, as, as well. When the person turns, you turn in the virtual world. So it's, you, you really get immersed in it. I've tried it. It is amazing. Um, so here is a part, and you can see the student now is holding up these uh, controllers and they zap certain uh, components. And 
uh, they, you know, if, again, if I can show you the video, you can see I'm literally building this uh, system, uh, which has a heat exchanger and other things in it that he's going to then evaluate. Um, and so here's the completed prod uh, thing that's just been connected together by the student. And then again, I do a, a risk assessment associated with it. Um, and another example is a noise hazard assessment, uh, same kind of concept, except they walk into a room with a lot of noisy machines and they have a noise level probe that goes along with it. And as they're going through this process, uh, an Excel spreadsheet is generated with uh, noise levels that they can analyze later. And then again, this all goes into a risk analysis uh, report by the student as part of their exercise. So this, this room now is, is more sophisticated in terms of, of its realism because it's more stagnant than the other one. Uh, but you can see certain uh, places where the student walks to and uh, generate some decisions based on, on what's going on as they are uh, using their noise meter there, which is real time showing them uh, noise levels bouncing around and then what they can do to say, replace a belt or install a noise enclosure as a control on it. So again, this is just a, a small uh, little bit of, of what NEAR has developed for his students. Now I know this isn't readily available, but maybe it's one of these things where you kind of heard it here first and that uh, certainly this kind of technology is going to be advanced over the next decade for sure and going to be probably pretty instrumental in a variety of different types of uh, learning uh, problems. I'd also like to give a shout out to Renee Anthony, who's I'm sure listening in right now. She uh, teaches a, a occupational safety course here at Iowa as well. And um, she utilizes uh, community engaged learning uh, as part of, of that process, knowing that students are going to have to be out there in the community. And, and you have to start at this level attempting to get them into that framework, right, of, of who is their audience and how are they approaching them. So an easy way to do that is to get them to put together, say, a public service announcement that, um, that they are engaging with a, in a sense, a virtual uh, community at the time they're, they're making it, but uh, they're certainly useful anyway uh, in terms of the final product. So, um, two examples here. Again, I can't show you the videos, but one on ladder safety and another one on electrical safety. So on ladder safety is, is fairly um, uh, simplistic or basic in terms of the student here getting across, in this case, to the homeowner, uh, what, what in the ladder safety tips they should be um, aware of to, to maintain their safety at, on the home. And uh, the a one on ground fault circuit interrupter, a little more sophisticated with diagrams and uh, you know, individual photos as you're going through the video of, in this case, what is the GFCI and, um, and some slides on the, the reduction in this case of electrocutions uh, associated with them and you know, how do you test them. And then a, a kind of final shout out by the student with a, a great photo in the background there. I think we can all uh, be assured that students, at least way more than my generation, <laughs> uh, of being comfortable in front of a camera now, right? Uh, they, uh, from what I see in my in my classes, they are much better oral communicators than than I ever was, and they they um, do a great job at these. So it's a thought as well to incorporate in your courses. Now we'll be hearing a lot this afternoon about health equity, um, and. Uh, the idea here is, you know, so how do you maybe incorporate these concepts into your curriculum? You know, where, where would it be best to place it? Uh, certainly it's important information. You, we can work on scattering it around in, in various ways, different homework assignments and that sort of thing. But uh, Dr. Kerry Castile is injury prevention uh, epidemiologist here in our ERC and runs that program for us. Uh, she is the director of our occupational health course that is required of all our trainees. So we figured this is as good a place as any to introduce this concept. And Dr. Brandy Jansen is a sociologist slash anthropologist who has been embracing this concept for, for years now and is, is very proficient at, at talking about it, which is, which is obviously important as well. So she's come up with a, uh, a series of lectures on this copy, two of them, uh, that uh, allow students to 
you know, as you can see from the outline, get first start with the concept definitions of race and racism, then focus specifically on racial disparities in the workplace, historic segregation, occupational risk, the uh, structural institutional racism in the workplace, and then how that translates out into healthcare settings, and then different workplace strategies to um, offset these disparities. So um, again, this is, I think, certainly is on, on all of your radar in terms of uh, trying to in, get this into your curriculum as well as you can. And um, I'm sure Brandy and or Carrie would be glad to um, uh, provide any advice if, if you're interested in, for example, the, the full outline of their course and how they've gone about that, their course lecture. So I'd like to finish up here with a shout out to professional development. Um, you know, this, this is another one of those things like how do it, we know it's important, but how do you get it into the curriculum? And I'll be honest that even, even five years ago, four years ago, it was more serendipity on our part that we happened to have a seminar in which we brought in a, a person from an industrial setting or whatever and started talking to students about, you know, what it is to be a professional and in their, in their workplace and, and provide some of that kind of really important information. Now uh, we are being much more proactive about it and ensuring that our seminar, uh, that all of our trainees are required to attend has at least three or four different topics uh, associated with professional development introduced within those seminars. So you can see here uh, interview skills, for example, and maybe even to the point of having a mock interview, lectures on communicating with workers, uh, and then, of course, DEI in the workplace, uh, harassment in the workplace. Uh, one of my pet peeves is email etiquette um, and, and how a student really needs to be trained in how to use email nowadays, I believe, uh, and their reticence to do so. So even something as simple as that, um, it, again, if uh, I'm sure, again, most of you are also on this bandwagon, so to speak, and, and realizing the importance of, of professional development. And lastly, from that, I give a shout out to this concept of an individual development plan. He's saying, well, so an IDP, you know, in, in real brief, uh, again, is, is asking the student to really do some real soul searching, some reflection on, on what are they good at and what are they not good at? And, and how can they enhance what they're not good at or, or what do they don't know now that they know they will need to know as a professional? And that last part is a little difficult and they, they may not understand when they first walk in the door here, but after two years of seminars and other things, they realize, oh, I need to focus on this more in my professional life. Okay, so um, that is the end of my talk, I guess, but in, in part of that, it's, um, I've just put out there that uh, the IDP process allows the faculty to understand what the needs are of the student in order to turn that back around. And good morning, everyone. Uh, glad to have you here as uh, session B, one of our concurrent sessions, Innovation and Research. I'm Jay Vitas. I'm the Chief of the Emerging Technologies Branch in the Direct uh, Division of Science Integration at NIOSH, and I'll be your moderator. Uh, we have two wonderful speakers. Uh, our first speaker is Casper Ben Dixon. He's from the Marshfield Clinic Research Institute in Marshfield, Wisconsin, and over to you. Thanks, Jay, um, and uh, uh, thanks for everybody for joining us. Uh, I'm currently at an undisclosed vacation uh, uh, vacation location in Montana. I won't tell you where I am at. It's my favorite spot in the world, uh, but hopefully the internet connection holds up. I'm very pleased, and, and I was honored to be asked to speak today uh, to talk about innovation research and really uh, just share where I hope my research portfolio is trying to move the needle a little bit in terms of innovation and, and, and improving uh, the, the world of workers, uh, specifically in ag. So the title today is, is Working uh, Ag Health and Safety um, Research Efforts Across Disciplines and the Translational Spectrum. I'm just going to start my timer now. So uh, first, conflict of interest. I have no conflicts of interest to a report and uh, neither do my family or anyone near to me in terms of any sort of profit or gain in terms of the research we conduct. 
the path forward, I'll do a little bit of introduction and then I'm gonna ask the group to kind of think with me translationally. Uh, and then I'm gonna try to have the group think with, uh, think together holistically. We'll have some final thoughts. And then uh, I think we're gonna do questions all the way at the end, right, Jay? So. I'll start with a little bit of my background. Uh, my personal background, I, I grew up on a farm and ranch in Southeast Idaho. We ran barley, wheat, and alfalfa. Uh, dad ran limousine Angus Cross cows. We had some sheep for a while there. We had some uh, about 60 head of horses and we ran an outfitting business. So I was very aggy uh, growing up. I also competed uh, in bareback bronc riding at college, high school, college, and the professional level uh, for about nine years. So I have a little bit different relationship in terms of risk taking than some of my safety colleagues. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, it's part of who I am. And I, I like to have it bear on the work that I do with the agricultural community. I also served as a volunteer firefighter. It's really my only medical training in terms of uh, uh, when we talk about occupational medicine, uh, I think about it as an EMT. That's I was a firefighter one EMT when I was in college. And you'll see that come out through one of the research projects that I'm gonna share today. So I am the director of the National Farm Medicine Center. The National Farm Medicine Center is a research department housed within the Marshfield Clinic Research Institute, uh, which serves basically the northern two thirds of Wisconsin. Uh, we do think of ourselves as a national center though. And you can see our mission statement there, uh, really thinking about research across uh, different models and uh, creating positive change for the agricultural world, uh, world. And when we talk about agriculture, we're talking about workers, but also uh, farmers, farm workers, their families, uh, the people that visit farms, so on and so forth. We're also the home, uh, proudly, of the National Children's Center, which has been located within our walls since 1997. Uh, we're happily celebrating our 25th anniversary this year. We're also co-founders in the Upper Midwest Ag Safety and Health Center, which is located in the University of Minnesota. We have a great team. Uh, I bring this up because I am, I am going to have us think interdisciplinary and, and translational. So when we look at our team, uh, there's lots of disciplines, lots of training represented here. Myself, I'm a cultural anthropologist by training. We also have uh, masters in public health. We have medical anthropologists, sociologists, informatics scientists, nursing PhDs, uh, biology majors, research coordinators, writers uh, across the entire gamut. Um, and so when, when we think about the research that I'm presenting today, these are the people that make it happen. These are the people that back me up and make our work uh, possible. For those of you not familiar with the CDC uh, Centers of Excellence, I just bring this up to show you kind of where our ag centers are located. Uh, they are all uh, renewed this year, which we're very proud of. And we have some new colleagues, it sounds like, so we'll have a new center uh, in our ag group. Now, uh, thinking translation, when we think about the innovation of research, one of the most critical innovations that we would possibly have in research is closing the gap between research and implementation. The biomedical sciences have, have recognized this as a problem in the last two decades. The idea that a good idea takes 20 years to implement is really unacceptable when we, when we think of what we can do with our work. Not only for our own sanity and pride as researchers to know that we're making a difference, but also when we think about research, designing it well so that it can be implemented sooner than later and appropriately and effectively. So when we think about taking the observations in a laboratory and a clinic and in, in the community to the inter level of intervention into the public, we have to think across uh, a couple of different spectrums. And so I, I bring up this translational research continuum here just to show the different groups at work and what those T1 through T4 or T0, depending on what translational scale you're working with, um, what that means. And really the, the older model of translational research really begins with that academic, the laboratory bench, um, those kind of laboratory interventions. I would argue that this model actually needs to be tweaked a little bit. Uh, I think that the community involvement at the back end towards the discovery stage needs to be bigger, especially when we talk about, about behavioral changes. So, um, but looking across the spectrum here, this is kind of what people are using. These are much more common uh, in the CTSAs. If you have one of those at your universities, you kind of think in this realm quite often. I think this model serves us well, but I think that occupational health and safety actually has a little bit to contribute to this model and needs to start engaging with it and modifying it for our own purposes. So 
if we're going to think translationally again, uh, in terms of the world of ag health and safety, at least, and I'm trying to think, you know, beyond ag for all, you know, all those that are not in the ag world, but for our colleagues working in ag, we really rely a lot uh, on voluntary uh, acceptance of best practices, which means that we have quite a few interventions, probably like 30 years of good ideas that more or less have been shelved in a lot of uh, a lot of cases, which is really disappointing. And so what we find is that people are taking good ideas that have run through the, the translational spectrum, but they realize that they don't have that community buy-in. So they're going back to the start. They're going back to the middle of the translational spectrum with the good idea. Uh, now this, you know, what, depending on what the intervention is, it may even become outdated uh, in, in the sense that it has to be reworked. It has to be reworked through the cycle. Um, I think for a lot of us, uh, what this means is we've done too little too late in terms of thinking at the beginning with communities. So I highlight again that the left-hand spectrum there where community involvement is much more critical uh, than we give it credit for. And therefore, moving across this translational spectrum with the community involvement earlier on really ensures the fact that we may not have to go back and recycle that idea back through the, the research process. The other problem that I'd like to bring up for this group is, is when we think about translational work, we know that federal dollars and the, and the heavy part of research is well-funded on the T0 through T3 end of things. That's where most of the NIH and CDC work is done, laboratory-based work. We often envision as genetics and pharmacogenetics, these really kind of expensive projects. That's a problem when we think about what happens at the end of the, of the translational scale. So when we move from trans, uh, research to, to translation and then to service, we're really kind of not supporting that further end of the translational spectrum with our federal dollars or with how we write our grants. Sometimes we force our T3, T4 ambitions into a model that better fits the T2, T3 kind of model so that our reviewers like it. And I think that's really problematic. We really need to be out front with this translational goal and the service goal. goal. Um, and so this is what I would argue the model looks like right now. There's a lot of federal support up at the front end. And then at the, at the end, when federal support may not support it or it's less than we need, we begin to rely on donor and community support. We actually have a great donor base in Marshfield where we all of our rocks, all of our rollover protection structures on tractors in Wisconsin, completely put on by donor dollars. That's a 99.9 .9 effective intervention. Uh, but there's no state or federal dollars to support it. They supported the research, but now we rely on donors to actually save lives. For my own part, uh, just a glimpse into my portfolio, when I think about translational research, I think about that community-based uh, approach. And what we found is that um, we're never gonna have enough safety and health professionals in the communities embedded, trusted neighbors, to the communities that we actually want to intervene upon and give our good ideas to. Therefore, there has to be someone in that community that will take that on and be part of that mission. Uh, and arguably, farmers are going to say, oh, we're too busy to be our own safety advocates. We've all heard that before. And so we, what we did is we asked a really basic kind of T0, T1 question, which is, if you were going to listen to someone and trust them with a new idea that would make you safer and healthier, who would you listen to? We did a pile sort, you know, we did quantitative and qualitative mixed methods, and it was great. It was a really enjoyable project. And we really thought that maybe bankers or insurance agents would have a role to play because they could incentivize with dollars safety and health. We found something completely different. They, farmers said we trust ourselves, other farmers, we trust our families, and we trust firefighters. And then this light goes off in my head thinking, of course. The, the esteem that firefighters hold in their community as rescuers and as as, as, as good citizens could be leveraged in a translational project. So we could take 30 years of good ideas, adjust the script, adjust the approach so that a firefighter could feel confident about saying those things and, and proposing those ideas and they could be the messenger. So we built a curriculum over the last uh, cycle, six year cycle. Uh, the, the curriculum is, is based on uh, volunteer firefighters from rural communities. It's an eight-hour uh, eight training, four hours in the classroom, four hours on a farm learning how to kind of implement these things. And we do an intro to ag, 
uh, really because not everyone's from a pharma farm these days. We do pre-planning and mapping. This is really the most familiar module. Then we get into hazard analysis and intervention, and then from first aid and then outreach for farm communities. So this is one way of doing that recycle from that T4, T3, taking those good ideas, reworking it through the research spectrum so that there's a different uh, intervention person, a different deliverer, a different community health worker type person out there. So this is some of the results. Um, I don't think I have too much time to share other than the main result is firefighters are willing to do this. They're willing to be their intervention person in their community. Um, and so that's the finding from the, the six year cycle is they, they understand that they can be a part of the solution. We thought we'd do 30 or 50 trainers in Wisconsin. We've actually done now over 100 in 10 different states and have worked with CASA, Canadian Ag Safety Association. So we're in five Canadian provinces. Firefighters are ready to do this. They really think it's part of their mission, um, good receptivity, and it aligns with other federal standards. So when we think about policy, I actually think more about getting my curriculum to fit NFPA standards, uh, National Firefighter Protection um, Standards, as opposed to some sort of labor standard on the other end of farm. Now, thinking holistically, Social sciences, we think holistically quite often. This is not a kind of tried and true, it's a tried and true idea. It's a little debated now whether or not it can be totally possible. But the basic idea is that the human experience is best examined as a complex system, the parts of which are better understood in the light of the whole. Medicine has, uh, has adopted this. Now don't think too far like holistic medicine, but in terms of treating the patient, the entire patient, instead of just the illness or just the injury. And this includes their environment and the other social determinants of health. These are becoming very common, more common language now. Occupational health and safety is really born out of engineering uh, more than anything else. And then it's adopted some public health attributes and some social, social sciences. But really, it, it, can find, it, it can find itself confined to thinking about the mitigation of hazards or risks or the, the treatment of resulting injury and illness. So along this kind of smaller field, I don't know if anyone's ever explored this idea of occupational studies, and I'm new to the field, and so maybe I'm talking out of school here, but this idea of revisiting the inquiry into occupation as a complex human domain that's not discrete from the other human experiences. And I think one thing that's really important when we do this is the benefits of work. I think oftentimes safety interventions, we act like we're, the, I think I've often feel the workers feel like we're intervening upon their lives and in farming, especially because it's their way of life, it's their home. And so if we can start to construct, reconstruct innovative research that explores the benefits of work in terms of what can we prescribe rather than mitigate? What can we celebrate rather than denounce? That approach I think buys us a little bit more credibility in terms of thinking about the whole human, the whole human experience, as opposed to just what they're doing wrong if you can follow that. And so within my own portfolio, uh, this is an example. Uh, so in the National Children's Center, the, the main thing that we're, we're battling in the Children's Center is 33 kids are injured every day on a farm, and about every week two kids are fatally uh, injured in a, some sort of farm-related incident in this country. Way too high numbers. We need, to, uh, we need to mitigate that as best we can, and those numbers have come down. Uh, but that idea, again, of, of telling someone how to raise their kids safely doesn't go without controversy. One of the approaches that we'd like to take uh, in terms of children is we look at immunology studies in the farm world. And we know that farm kids that are in utero or exposed early in life to complex environments that include livestock and their feedstuffs and manures, they have a lower rate of asthma, allergy, and atypy. This is a paradox. How can, how can you have a place that's healthy and thrive as a child, but also be so dangerous. So starting to pull this paradox apart so that we can mitigate injury and fatality, but celebrate healthy uh, and unique and enjoyable ways of life. So these, these are, and this isn't just a social construct of the benefit, right? This is measured. If you look down the right-hand side there, uh, you can see that, uh, these, these exposure rates, these complex environments, rate of uh, allergy is, is so much lower than their urban counterpart. And this really halts the atopic march. Uh, for those of you not familiar, the atopic march leads to lifelong asthma. Lifelong asthma is one of the most globally debilitating, expensive 
uh, diagnosis because there's no treatment. Uh, there's no cure, there's only treatment and it debilitates the workforce. So these kids in this environment have something to say about slowing that down. These are the social and cultural benefits. These are less easily measured. This, this is gonna take more innovative work uh, because these are perceptions and we have to be careful about buying into perception without some sort of validation, right? So the social and cultural perceptions, the values that go with this is these kids have a better work ethic, they have more responsibility, better understanding of life and death, they have improved empathy for the care of other living things, practical skills, problem solving, so on and so forth. Now, the challenges with this include parent bias. bias. Um, my kid is, of course, I, my kid is a little bit ahead of every all these other kids and they're smarter, stronger, faster. Uh, we can't, we have to be careful with exceptionalism, right? The, the idea that being rural makes you exceptional. You're just as likely to get COVID. You're just as likely to get hurt. Those kinds of things. There's no exceptionalism around that kind of health attribute. So, but we have to ask ourselves, what if the biological and the social cultural benefits are real? And we're running out of farms. We're running out of the laboratory actually to, to conduct this research. So this is why it's critical, I think, in terms of thinking about the benefits of work and the benefits of lifestyle so that we can also say, well, let's mitigate the injury. Uh, this is just another plot on the microbiome. Uh, this is uh, resulting from research that we do uh, with the uh, Washington University specifically looking at the uh, fecal and nasal airways of dairy workers versus non-dairy workers. You can see the plot there on the right, where you can see quite a bit of uh, diversity between the nasal uh, farmer and non-farmer, right? And one of the backsides of this is uh, there's reduced MRSA. So there's less, there's more competition, uh, greater diversity in the nostrils of these dairy workers. Uh, and that could probably prove not only a health benefit for them working our own cows and a diverse microbiome, but how do we harness that and maybe apply it and mitigate clinical infections? So just an example of where innovation can lead once you kind of open the field. So I think I have a few minutes left. Um, in terms of being trying to be innovative with our research, I think that I came from a discipline where I, I wasn't thinking about occupational health and safety. I was thinking about cultural values to begin with. So in terms of that, my innovation, I think, is really uh, just trying to do my work, trying to do the work I've designed. But I think it has some value in the future of research and, and trying to change things up and move the needle. So I think the future is holistic, uh, at least for my own portfolio. Uh, I, I think of the worker first as a person and always as a person, uh, that the benefits of work may be as or more important than the hazards when we talk about voluntary acceptance in terms of uh, intervening injury and illness. I think the future is interdisciplinary. Uh, I don't think it's just the work of social scientists whatsoever. I think it has to be mixed because uh, that's how we get that whole complex picture formulated. I also believe the future is dependent on the ability to translate our research. Uh, facts are great, uh, discoveries are great, but facts are, and discoveries are better measured by the impact that they might have with their implementation. I'm sorry, as much as we want like 99% effective, uh, if 99% effective won't be adopted or placed into policy, I have to go with 98 if it will move across the finish line. I also think the future is more community-based. Um, I think that we have to start with our worker population and their families and their communities uh, before we go down the road of really any sort of adoption. And if we haven't done that, we do need to go back and bring them into the fold, even though it might mean changing the look and the feel and, and the, the, the rhetoric of our um, good ideas in terms of worker health and safety. So I know I was talking quickly, a little bit of acknowledgement of the funding that went into these great projects and my great colleagues, immunologists, microbiologists, um, trainers, education per, uh, folks, these, these are the ones that, uh, this is how we get it done. So I acknowledge them and I will stop there. All right. Hey, thank you so much, Casper. And you are correct. We're gonna take uh, questions at the end. I see a little bit of dialogue going on in the chat, which is fantastic. And some of them are quasi questions. Uh, you can bring them back up at the end of the uh, uh, session here after we have our second speaker, who is uh, Bill Shaw from the University of Connecticut School of Medicine. And over to you, Bill, thanks. Hi, everyone, I'm Bill Shaw. Uh, I'm a, a co-center director for one of the Total Worker Health Centers, and I've been asked to talk about 
research innovations in total worker health. So um, if you're feeling a little frazzled by all the talk about the future yesterday, uh, you can rest assured that I'm going to talk about current research or, or, or research that's just getting underway. And um, I'm going to kind of present five different areas of, of research innovation I think are the most of most interest related to total worker health and also give some examples from our total worker health centers. So I apologize in advance if I, if I misconstrue anything on one of these projects from our other total worker health centers, please feel free to clarify on the chat if, if you need to. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so I don't know if total worker health has really been defined so far in this meeting. So if anyone happens to be on this call who's kind of new to this concept, I wanted to just provide a definition. Uh, so about 2003, NIOSH established this initiative to promote policies, programs, and practices that integrate protection from work-related safety and health hazards with promotion of injury and illness prevention efforts to advance worker well-being. Uh, and some important things about total worker health are that this is to address not just only not just job demands and job environment, but also work organization factors that are really critical to health outcomes. And um, we believe that if this is done right, it has positive impacts, not just for workers, but for employers as well, um, by um, improving their operational effectiveness, by improving their workplace culture and things like that. So um, there are many, many tools and resources available, both through the NIOSH Total Worker Health website, as well as all of the centers. Um, but uh, one, uh, uh, one document I wanted to kind of highlight, it is referenced at the bottom here, this Fundamentals of Total Worker Health Approaches. If you want a quick study on Total Worker Health, this is a really good place to start. Uh, this has five um, essential defining elements of total worker health, which we keep try to keep in mind with all of our research. That is to demonstrate leadership commitment to worker health and safety at all levels of the organization, to design work to eliminate and reduce safety and health hazards, but also promote worker well-being. So this well-being world word we will see a lot here, um, and promote and support worker engagement through program design and implementation. So participatory approaches are really top on the list with total worker health. Um, to ensure confidentiality and privacy of workers while, while still trying to address their health issues and to integrate these systems into uh, to advance worker well-being into actual organizational decision making, which, which is sometimes the hardest thing to do, and especially in the context of a research design. So, um, you know, one of the things you first things you have to do um, if you're a researcher around total worker health is to try to translate these basic ideas about total worker health into a research design. And so there are many, many examples across the centers of different kinds of uh, models and theoretical frameworks and conceptual diagrams to try to uh, get from a general idea about total worker health to something that can be operationalized and studied in an intervention context. So this is an example from our center trying to look at the issue of integration and how to understand that as a really a function of work organization that's very central to a number of elements around uh, factors in the workplace and, and health outcomes that affect workers. But so, so I invite you, if you're interested in looking at how your research could be adapted to the total worker health context or how it might fit, a good place to, to look is for these kinds of conceptual diagrams and frameworks that are in all of our, on all of our websites. So um, I'm going to talk about kind of five areas that I, that I think are particularly uh, important in total worker health innovation. And the first one is implementation. So I'll be uh, mimicking a lot of uh, Casper's points from the last uh, presentation. Um, but you know, we often think of implementation in the context of R2P or disseminating research results. And I agree with Casper that we really need to move this up sooner um, th than later. So. Um, if you think about designing a research study, you really need to uh, think about all of the implementation factors that you can measure right from the get-go. Uh, and I think that in our total worker health research projects that we're seeing you know, more and more this focus on, in, on implementation factors right at the beginning. So you, know, you need to know not just whether the program works, but you also need to know um, how it worked, why it worked, you know, what were the specific uh, elements of a particular occupation, industry, or workplace that enabled the program to be effective, uh, who were the people that made it happen, and things like that. So really trying to uh, address these other kinds of issues. And if depending on your background, 
you may call this process evaluation or realist review uh, methods or uh, logic models or mediating and moderating variables. We all have different names for these, but trying to understand the things that were the, you know, what happened that allowed the program to be implemented and be implemented successfully. So, you know, one of the reasons that, uh, or one of the things that's helping our research along in terms of implementation is to um, uh, take a look at implementation science, which is, which is a rapidly evolving field right now. Um, there's a really good um, publication out there if you want to read on, on more on implementation by Rebecca Guerin and colleagues that came out in 2021. Um, but this is just one example of an implementation framework that seems to be pretty popular right now. It's the EPIS implementation framework, and EPIS stands for Exploration, Preparation, Implementation, and Sustainment. But if we kind of apply this to total worker health, a lot of these issues are really, really important. Um, so if you kind of look inside this diagram, uh, things like uh, outer context, so understanding uh, aspects of leadership, environment, and funding that made a project successful, bridging factors, things like having an internal champion that made the program successful, uh, innovation factors, um, how well was the program fit to the specific organization, uh, and uh, inner context, things that we would normally think of as kind of internal validity issues. So when we set out to design a, a total worker health research intervention study, we really need to measure so, so many things so that we know what made the project successful and how well can this really be reproducible in other kinds of contexts. So as an example of something that's been done recently, kind of along these lines of trying to collect implementation data as soon as possible, is this uh, organizational readiness tool that was developed by Michelle Robertson and colleagues. As you can see from this figure, this measure was designed to capture many of the ISDs about, about evaluating current context within an organization. So whether the delivery method and contents fit to usual organizational communication and culture, to what extent individuals within the organization are, are aware of the need for change and are motivated to try something new, many of those issues. So, so we can actually develop measures that help us to define better intervention studies because uh, by knowing exactly how, where that organization fits uh, in the implementation um, per, uh, continuum. So uh, as another example from, this is from our Harvard Total Worker Health Center. This is a little different. This is actually using implementation as a whole intervention strategy. So this was a project with low wage food service workers that I, I believe is, is near completion. And in this study, the researchers first developed and then followed a step-by-step -step implementation guideline to arrive at changes that would support worker well-being uh, and be feasible to implement in similar work settings. Uh, this involved going to individual work sites to get input to study design, to develop action plans addressing specific health issues at individual sites, and then developing a, a sequential modules of intervention to address these specific needs. So this is something we see a lot of in total worker health research is the need to be able to tailor intervention approaches to the specific needs of an organization, but also have it be reproducible in other contexts. And this is a kind of a recurring challenge in total worker health research. So the next topic I want to cover is impact. And by this, I mean that in addition to being able to measure whether uh, an intervention program actually improves worker health and safety, we also want to know, did it really change the organization in some way? Uh, and I think this is a developing innovation in total worker health research, trying to understand, you know, did the intervention actually change the fabric of the organization in some way that's me meaningful and measurable? So to give you kind of an example of this um, is a, uh, a study that's being done right now at our Oregon Total Worker Health Center. Uh, this is a study focused on developing and validating a total worker health climate scale. This builds on the group's prior expertise in developing and validating measures of safety climate. But for this new scale, the perspective of the measures to, to really look at a culture of the organization with respect to total worker health and the shared values within the organization around physical health and mental well-being. Uh, this works just beginning with the new funding cycle, but this is a good example of really trying to measure things at the organizational level rather than the individual level to measure the success uh, and processes of our intervention programs. 
Um, just to give you a couple more examples of this organizational level type of um, assessment, these are two things that we've kind of been experimenting with in our own center, effect modifier assessment, uh, or EMA, and ripple effects mapping, or REM. Uh, these are both um, examples of um, qualitative approaches, so um, to try to study changes at the organizational level. So with, with effect modifier assessment, uh, you have workshop participants who are asked to list out changes within their organization during the time of a, a program implementation. And then they're asked to estimate the extent to which any of these changes may have been specifically attributable to the program. Um, in the ripple effects mapping, workshop participants are asked to visually map effects of a program especially the kinds of impacts the program may have had on things that are really represent cascading effects and not initially um, uh, outcomes that were designed into the program. So these are just two examples of things that we might begin to see more of in total worker health research where we're trying to measure impact at the organizational level as well as the individual level. So my next topic is worker engagement. I mentioned already that this is sort of a critical element um, or has been defined as one of the critical elements of total worker health and participatory methods have really been uh, very much a part of total worker health research so far. Um, if you're like me, you know, when I first started thinking about total worker health, I was imagining you know, a, 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 an office full of desks and people on it neatly fitting within organizational structures like this organizational chart. And uh, as you introduce your program from top to bottom within the company, uh, starting with the, the CEO, um, this would eventually kind of lead to organizational changes that would trickle down through the organization and resulting in improved well being ultimately for workers uh, who are the line workers. Uh, but I think what we're finding in total worker health research, the, the more we go, is that most workplaces don't look at all like this. And actually, a lot of people are left out of um, research if you kind of just use that paradigm for accessing workers. So, you know, we part-time workers, temporary workers, contract workers, low-income workers, workers with chronic illness or other forms of disadvantage are, are frequently left out if you start at the top and work your way down. So a lot of our current research projects in total worker health are really focused on, you know, how do we get to these workers um, better? And um, so I'm going to give you some examples of that. One example is to, I think we're beginning to move the total worker health paradigm from primary prevention to thinking about secondary prevention or thinking about specific subgroups of workers who are perhaps in, at more risk of health problems or have emerging health problems already. One example of that uh, is the well-being of cancer at work or we can work study um, at the Colorado um, Total Worker Health Center. This is a project led by Kathy Bradley and its goal is to improve cancer survivors well-being and work outcomes by enhancing oncology care team support. Uh, another example is a, a study of home care workers with chronic pain that is planned at the Oregon uh, Total Worker Health Center. Um, and this is a project led by Ryan Olson and the goal is to support workers with chronic pain to prevent progression to work disability, opioid use and poor mental health. And a third example is a study um, led by Brad, Brad Evanoff uh, at our Iowa Midwest Research, uh, Total Worker Health Center uh, on preventing suicide and improving mental health in construction workers. And so this is a program to adapt a multi-component suicide prevention and mental health program to incorporate workplace culture and organizational factors in those programs. So I think all three of these represent kind of a shift in total worker health research to start thinking about uh, subgroups of workers who are, are particularly in need of organizational support and where work organization factors might be really critical to important uh, health outcomes. So uh, one more example is this study that I thought was very innovative in, in a number of respects, but really highlights how workplaces and, and uh, the way that workers fit within organizations can be very, very different. This is a project led by Katherine James at the Colorado Total Worker Health Center. Uh, she's studying uh, farm, farm owners and farm workers in the San Luis Valley of Colorado. This is a farming community where drought and other problems have really led to severely elevated addiction and suicide rates. And what's interesting, especially innovative, I think about this research study is the use of social network analysis. So she proposes to look at analyzing the social networks of, of farm workers, farm owners, and all of the resources within their communities 
as uh, ways of providing information and uh, intervention for them. So I'm really trying to understand how, how workplaces uh, are organized. One way to do that is to look at social connectivity. I think that's really, intervent, uh, really innovative. So um, I think more and more we're starting to go to these other kinds of industries and occupations where people aren't so neatly organized and finding uh, research methods that allow us to understand those structures better. So my next topic is worker well-being. You know, um, we've already heard a lot about this in our meeting so far about the importance of, of understanding worker well-being in the context of, and this is really a central issue in total worker health. You know, we have uh, in the US, we're probably a tiny bit behind other countries because we have workers' compensation systems that have um, really not allowed us to think of job burnout and mental health outcomes as a work injury or illness issue. So we have kind of a long way to go. But one positive note uh, was this um, report that I noticed uh, last week, which is this uh, American Psychological Association just released this 2022 work and well-being survey. I invite you to look at this in more detail on your own. But what was interesting was that 71% of workers believe their employer is now more concerned about mental health than they have been in the past. And 81% of workers said that mental, the way that employers deal with mental health issues will be really a top on the list of, of, of the criteria they used to at looking at future jobs. So I think that's, that's interesting and a positive indication for us. Um, another uh, kind of measure development uh, uh, that in total worker health that's been very important is this uh, identification of the worker well-being questionnaire. So this has been developed by NIOSH. And if you're interested in hearing more about the measure itself and its development, uh, Cha Cha Chang will be leading um, a meeting in a pre-conference um, post-conference meeting tomorrow. So if you're interested in hearing more about it, you can join that. But it clearly is an, a movement towards trying to um, look at worker well-being in a much larger span of potential factors and variables uh, that's, that's kind of illustrated here. Um, I think reaching this level of, of developing standardized instruments in this area is certainly an accomplishment for NIOSH and also a really big innovation for us in the field. You know, a lot is still to be learned in terms of worker well-being, I believe. Um, I think another indication from total worker health research that worker well-being is really becoming uh, foremost in our research designs is the, the, uh, the new addition of four centers of excellence in the past year. And all of these are focused on mental health and well-being of some sort. So the Johns Hopkins uh, Poe Center is exclusively focusing on mental health outcomes uh, in the workforce. The Utah Center for Promotion of Work Equity Research, or UPower, is looking at issues of power structures in the workplace and how that relates to worker well-being. The California Labor, Labor Laboratory, sorry, Call Center, uh, is focusing on non-traditional employment arrangements. So again, looking at uh, how that affects worker well-being. Uh, the Carolina Center for Total Worker Health has, a, as one of its two major projects, a uh, study of rural and urban clinician well-being during COVID-19. So again, more focus on well-being. So I think you know, this sort of tells us that the, the future of Total Worker Health is, is very much focused in this direction. Um, we just heard from Susan Peters at the Harvard Total Worker Health Center about her work to further validate and, and look at this measure of thriving in the workplace. So I think that's, um, uh, again, an example of measure development that will be useful to us in total worker health research. We had an interesting discussion in our breakout group last night about you know, where are we headed with, with this idea of worker well-being. Do we want to set, you know, is there, are there thresholds uh, above which we're trying to have workers feel or you know, is, is well-being really different depending on industry and occupation, you know, what's the end game of what, what are we striving for here? We don't have like injury reduction as a, as a goal. So we really need to think a little bit more about, you know, what is the end game? What's the goal of studying worker well-being and mental health? What is it that we're trying to accomplish? So it's still a lot more to do, but, but measures like this will really help us to sort that out. Uh, and lastly, you know, a lot has been said already about research partnerships. I think um, the kinds of partnerships that, that I think about the most are, are when we're starting to do research and uh, how to connect with organizations and how to find 
ways to get to workers that may not necessarily be through employers. And there's been a lot of growth in this area. So just to give you some examples, um, uh, we have one project that's really been going on for quite a while and is probably our best example from total worker health research of, of, of kind of reaching to workers in a different way. This is a, the Greater Lawndale Healthy Work Project led by Lanai Hebert Barron. And it's to understand how work impacts health and to identify community solutions to promote health. So this is really working through community organizations to reach workers and improve health. Um, another example is um, a project at our center on, on total worker health employer crisis preparedness led by Cora Roloffs. And this is to an effort to partner with HR professionals to incorporate worker well-being issues into the crisis planning efforts of small and medium-sized businesses. And uh, last, another project at our center is uh, called Safety and Health Through Integrated Teams. It's a project led by Alicia Kralski. And right now we are trying to look at the possibility of partnering with labor unions to actually disseminate total worker health policies and practices among healthcare workers. So kind of working in a, through a, a different pathway for intervention. So I know that was a lot of information really fast, but I tried to be as representative as I could of the work that's going on across our total worker health centers. Um, the areas I think are, are really represent the most important research innovations for us are incorporating implementation factors early in the study design process, um, assessing organizational impact at a, at a higher level than just uh, workplace sur worker surveys, uh, trying to develop uh, methods to engage at-risk workers, subgroups of workers who may be at greater risk of health uh, outcome, negative health outcomes, um, expanding concepts of worker well-being. We've talked a lot about that already in this meeting and expanded research partnerships. So those are my areas that I think are, are kind of most interesting to consider in terms of future research possibilities. And thank you very much for your attention.